The uh, Information Policy Census and National Archives Subcommittee uh, will now come to order. And good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing entitled the 2010 Census and Assessment of the Census Bureau's Preparedness. Today's hearing, as the title indicates, will examine the improvements the Census Bureau has made in its operations and systems leading up to the 2010 enumeration. We will further examine those specific IT systems and budget uncertainties uh, which caused GAO to categorize the Bureau's efforts as high risk. Today's dialogue should lead to more certainty and knowledge of the mitigation strategies for 2010 census challenges. We all have one goal in mind and a true accurate reflection of our country. I appreciate Dr. Groves' leadership and efforts. Uh, and we have with us today distinguished colleagues uh, who will be joining us who have asked to participate in this hearing. Without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. The purpose of today's hearing is to complete, to complete the census cycle. We began this journey uh, many hearings ago. Uh, this subcommittee has visited the compilation of the master address file known as LUCA and its in intricacies. We examine the external challenges of counting our country and the consequences of undercounts. We study group quarter validation and complete count committees. We address fingerprinting and hiring of census workers. We have further assessed the advertising campaign to reach our hardest to count populations. So today's efforts must now focus on the Bureau itself. Uh, with an assessment of its preparedness to complete the 2010 task. First on our panel, we will hear from Mr. Arnold Jackson, Associate Director of the Census Bureau. And welcome. Uh, next, we will hear from Mr. Robert Goldenkopf, Director of Strategy of Strategic Issues at Government Accountability. Thank you for being here. And our final panelist is Ms. Judy Gordon, Associate Deputy Inspector at the Department of Commerce. This panel is well suited to answer all questions and provide updates on the Bureau's preparedness. We look forward to their insight into this effort and I thank all of the witnesses for appearing today and look forward to their testimonies. And at this time I will now yield to any member who has an opening statement. Ms. Chu, would you have an open? No, you're fine. How about Mr. Cuellar, would you have a, oh, no. All right, then we will take testimony now. Uh, Mr. Jackson, uh, we will start uh, with you, and, uh, and we will hear first from, from you, Mr. Jackson, and secondly, uh, from Mr. Goldenkopf, and uh, uh, finally from Ms. Gordon. And uh, it, is the, uh, it is the policy of this committee to swear in our witnesses before they testify. I'd like to ask each Thank you, Chairman Clay, uh, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to provide an operational update. I'm sorry. You pull it to you, pull it closer. Thank you. Is that there better? You All right. Thank you, uh, 
Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to provide an operational update including the status of the paper-based operations control system of the 2010 decennial census. Mr. Chairman, as you know, we are underway. The census is ongoing and proceeding, and we are on a path to a successful 2010 census. The efforts of the previous years are paying off, including the support of this subcommittee and committee, and our work with stakeholders are now paying dividends. A complete and accurate census is a complex endeavor. However, the finely tuned strategies we have to count every person in this country are paying off. All of these efforts from census operations to promotion are grounded in thorough research, extensive coordination and preparation, and local knowledge. The 2010 census enumeration actually began in Norvik, Alaska on January 25th. In this small village, which piques the interest and imagination of the country each decade, the resulting news generated interest from over 80 million people, a great introduction for the 2010 census. We've also conducted an operation known as Group Quarters Advance Visit, which facilitates the process of counting residents in group quarters. Census workers visited more than 270,000 group quarters locations to plan for the group quarters enumeration. We've started uh, an enumeration uh, of an enumeration activity known as Update Leave, uh, where we actually go to addresses where the address may not represent the actual location of the housing unit. We're doing Update Enumerate, which began on March 22nd and ends May 29th. Update Enumerate is primarily used in areas with seasonal housing, therefore a high number of vacants, American Indian areas, and colonias in South Texas. The vast majority of housing units, however, more than 120 million, received their questionnaires in the mail last week. Mail out mail back and for the 2010 census includes an advance letter, the questionnaire, and a reminder postcard. And for the first time, we will send a replacement questionnaire to about 25 million households and census tracts where we anticipate a low response rate. This will be done on April 3rd. These stage efforts are intended to encourage participation. We have a program that is available on our website known as Take 10 Challenge. It's a challenge that we have initiated to encourage some friendly competition between communities to compare their response participation rates to each other. As you know, participation is the foundation of an accurate and complete census. But that's not all. We also have telephone questionnaire assistance and an integrated communications program. The goal of the telephone questionnaire assistance is to quickly provide assistance whether it's answering a question, sending a language assistance guide, or sending a replacement questionnaire to call us. Further, we have 30,000 questionnaire assistance centers that are now open where respondents can get help filling out a census form. But of course, as you know, and as we have testified, our directors testified recently, the cornerstone of the 2010 census promotional effort is the communications program, which includes both advertising and partnerships. The campaign has proven successful, and we are uh, experiencing high levels of interest and indications of intent to participate in the census. As you know, by increasing a response rate, we can dramatically affect the cost and effectiveness of our non-response operations. In a matter of a few weeks, we will be prepared to send as many as 700,000 temporary workers to the field to enumerate between 47 million and 55 million housing units. While it is important to note that we are much better prepared than we were in any previous census, we are not without concerns. We continue to manage daily the risk of instability and limited functionality of our paper-based operations control system and our decennial application applicant personnel payroll system. The Census Bureau undertook the development of the paper-based operations control system as a high-risk alternative in 2008. The compressed PBOCS development schedule has resulted in abbreviated testing cycles, which occur much closer to operations than we would have preferred. That, in turn, has led to a higher number of defects than we would have expected. However, we are prioritizing them as we move toward operations. Workarounds such as stag staggering start times, sharing printing resources, and other such uh, alternatives are allowing us choices and trade-offs that ensure successful field operations despite less than perfect IT systems. 
I am managing these risks daily and our outlook is improving. We have recently bolstered both the uh, paper-based operations control system and the DAP systems infrastructure and technical support. The Census Bureau remains cautiously optimistic and I am personally encouraged by recent progress and by the dedication of staff and contractors. In the last couple of weeks, not only have I overseen the installation of new hardware and witnessed a decreasing number of defects, but we've been able to slowly increase user capacity, all indications that day by day this system is becoming mature. PBOCS is functioning and currently supporting our field operations. Over the next several months, hundreds of important tasks will be completed, and your continued support is crucial to a successful census. Again, I thank the subcommittee for this opportunity, and I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Goldenkopf, you may proceed. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to provide an update on the Census Bureau's readiness for the 2010 enumeration. With one week remaining until Census Day, the nation has entered one of the most crucial time periods in the decade-long census life cycle. Earlier this month, the Bureau mailed out questionnaires to around 120 million households. In the coming weeks, the Bureau will launch additional operations aimed at enumerating certain hard-to-count populations, as well as the estimated 50 million households that failed to mail back their census forms. The success of these operations will have a major impact on the accuracy of the census, as well as its ultimate cost, now estimated at around, at around $14.7 billion. As requested, I will update the subcommittee on the state of the census, paying particular attention to, first, the reliability of key IT systems, and second, the extent to which critical enumeration activities are on track. Overall, the Bureau's readiness for a successful headcount is mixed. It is deeply troubling that at this late date, two critical IT systems have not yet demonstrated their ability to function reliably under full operational loads. The performance problems plaguing these two systems represent the most significant threat to the cost and the quality of the enumeration. Specifically, the Decennial Applicant Personnel and Payroll System, or DAPS, the automated system the Bureau is using to process applicants and handle the payroll of the Bureau's massive temporary labor force needed to be fully functional under a heavy load by mid-March. However, the system had limited capacity and was sluggish. These shortcomings occurred despite the fact that 100,000 temporary employees were on board, far below the roughly 600,000 employees that will be working when non-response follow-up is in full swing in a few weeks. As of March 22nd, Bureau officials stated that they had taken steps to improve DAPS's performance, including upgrading the system software and installing additional hardware. More will be known about the success of these fixes in the coming days. The Bureau also needs to resolve ongoing problems with the workflow management system it will use to administer field operations. Although the first release of this system was deployed for early field activities in January, and certain components of the second release were deployed in February, both releases have known defects, including limited functionality, slow performance, and problems generating certain progress and performance reports. The Bureau also restricted the number of users in each local census office due to capacity limitations. What's more, the component of the second release that will be used to manage non-response follow-up, the largest census field operation, is still being tested and is scheduled to be released in mid-April. This is about three weeks later than planned and barely ahead of when non-response follow-up is scheduled to begin in early May. As a result, little time will be left to resolve any problems identified during testing. Other functions are faring better. Key enumeration activities are generally on track and some activities aimed at improving the participation of hard-to-count groups are more robust compared to similar efforts during the 2000 census. For example, the Bureau has launched an aggressive outreach and promotion effort. Key differences from 2000 include increased staffing for the Bureau's partnership program, targeting, targeted paid advertising based on marketing and attitudinal research, and a contingency fund to address unexpected events. Moreover, to improve the participation of transients, seasonal farm workers, and others at risk of being missed by the Census, the Bureau launched its Be Counted program earlier this month. 
This effort makes forms available in around 40,000 locations across the country, such as libraries and community centers. Moving forward, it will be important for the Bureau to quickly identify the problems affecting key IT systems and test solutions. Further, given the complexity of the census and the likelihood that other glitches might arise, it will be important for the Bureau to stay on schedule, monitor operations, and have plans and personnel in place to quickly address operational issues. These operational considerations aside, I want to stress that the Census Bureau cannot, cannot secure a complete count on its own. The public must also fulfill its civic duty to return their questionnaires in a timely manner. According to the Bureau, each percentage point increase in the mail response rate saves taxpayers around $85 million and yields more accurate data. The bottom line is that the success of the 2010 Census is now, to a large degree, in the hands of the nation's residents. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, this concludes my remarks, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you or other members of the subcommittee might have. Thank you so much, Mr. Golden Call. Ms. Garden, you're up. Five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry. Why don't you pull the mic closer and make sure it's on. Okay. okay. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee. How about a little closer? Okay. Pull it closer. Uh, we are pleased. Helper. Okay. Okay. We are pleased to be here today to share our perspectives. Okay on the Census Bureau's readiness for this year's decennial count. As my colleagues on the panel have uh, noted, the Census is already in high gear with more than 100 million residents receiving Census forms last week. However, key information technology systems continue to experience performance and functionality shortfalls, and these systems can affect the ultimate schedule, cost, and success of the Census. My statement today will cover three areas. First, the systems issues and their risk to non-response follow-up, or NERFU. Second, the importance of monitoring NERFU cost. And third, some initial observations from our field work. Critical to the success of, of NERFU is the Paper-Based Operations Control System, or PBOCS. This system is essential to handling assignments to enumerators, tracking questionnaires, and reporting on the status of operations. PBOCS development has been compressed to meet the schedule. The inevitable impact of this just-in-time approach is that certain errors are not being found until the system is in actual operation and not all capabilities are implemented. PBOCS has suffered from slow performance and continues to experience, experience complete system outages. An outage earlier this week lasted an entire day. A similar outage during the large NERFU operation would be particularly serious. The Decennial Applicant Personnel and Payroll System, or, or DAPS, has experienced similar performance limitations and operational impacts. DAPS is critical to recruiting, managing, and paying the enormous temp temporary census workforce. To allow for installation and testing of improvements, local census office systems have been shut down at night and on weekends. This prevents Census from adding more shifts to catch up on work that has fallen behind schedule. Census engineers and operational managers are aggressively attacking the system issues. Nevertheless, Census will have to rely on workarounds to compensate for system limitations. Workarounds must be fully tested and clearly explained to minimize further disruptions. Turning to cost and cost containment, it will be especially important for Census to monitor and control NERFU costs. Address canvassing went 25% over its budget, largely due to overspending on wages and mileage reimbursements to temporary address listers. NERFU is much bigger, so any cost overruns will be much more expensive. The ability to produce valid budget estimates is, is essential to cost containment. Wide budget variances among local census offices and address canvassing uh, from less than 1% to over 800% indicates significant weaknesses in the Bureau's budget estimation capability and uncertainty in the decennial cost. Finally, I will briefly mention two major challenges found in our initial observations in the field during update, the update leave operation. First, our staff saw firsthand how the so slow performance and lack of systems reliability are affecting efficiency in local census offices. We observe work getting interrupted, data having to be entered into the system more than once, and completion of tasks being delayed. 
Second, we identified a few areas in which it appears that maps were not updated from address canvassing. If widespread, this would be a significant problem. We are working with the Bureau to determine both the extent and reasons for these map errors. In summary, Mr. Chairman, although mo much of the Bureau's plan is on track, IT problems place the efficiency and accuracy of non-response follow-up at risk, and final decennial costs remain uncertain. While our testimony today discusses serious IT system challenges, we are mindful of the extraordinary efforts being made by a very dedicated census staff to achieve a successful outcome. This concludes my statement, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you or any other members of the subcommittee may have at this time. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. I want to thank all of the witnesses for their testimony. Now the committee will proceed to the uh, question and answer period. Uh, and we will begin with Mr. Mr. McHenry, who will be allowed to give an opening statement as well as questions. Mr. Well, thank McHenry. you, Mr. Chairman. And it's, um, you know, right in keeping with your testimony, um, I, I certainly appreciate, Mr. Chairman, you have in this hearing today because it, it is obvious that we still have a lot of questions and issues to resolve, even though the cen Census Day is just less than a week away. Um, and I, I, it's great concerns that I hear from every one of you. Uh, significantly different uh, from the, the Bureau compared to the last testimony we had uh, from, from Dr. Groves, but I do appreciate you all coming. I know it's very busy right now, um, both for the IG, for the GAO, as well as the Census Bureau. Um, but it, it does seem to me like we're, we're jumping the gun a little bit on this hearing. I think we're going to need to have another hearing uh, and, and see how the mail is coming in, uh, because we're, we're just days into mail coming back in and getting uh, determining our response rate. So I do think uh, uh, with, with the chairman's leadership, uh, we, we should be able to do that uh, when Congress comes back. Um, most households didn't even receive their 2010 questionnaire until about a week and a half ago. A lot of my constituents are writing and calling about this as well, which is good, a good sign that people are uh, aware of the census. But um, I certainly appreciate the chairman's leadership with what's going on and, uh, and making sure that we have frequent hearings on this matter. As, uh, as uh, Dr. Groves has stated, uh, he would like to have an ongoing dialogue with us as well. And, and Mr. McHenry, we do intend on holding hearings uh, to look at the uh, mail back response rate and other functions of the, of the Bureau and their effort. Well, thank you. And I, I'll get to my questioning now. but. Uh, um, you know, we've got some issues here. I, uh, Mr. Jackson, you're slightly less uh, uh, positive in, in, in the tone that you have uh, about uh, the, the Bureau's preparedness. Is the Bureau prepared for the 2010 Census? Uh, Congressman, yes, sir, we are. I am attempting to be candid, not in any way not optimistic. I'm convinced we will have a successful uh, okay. census. As you know, two years ago when we undertook what we okay. call the replan, uh, we uh, stated that choosing this path of doing paper-based operations in lieu of continued automation would be somewhat high risk. Uh, in general, that's what we're experiencing now. We think we're prepared. Okay. Uh, Time is short. So mm -hmm. um, are, are you, uh, is the Bureau still on track to meet its, its, uh, uh, its budget outlook and view? For non-response follow-up? Yes, sir. We've done a complete uh, budget review of non-response follow-up. Uh, we have looked at over 20 line items and we feel that we are more than prepared to do a successful non-response follow-up at a range of response estimates on time and within the budget we have. Mr. Goldenkoff, is that uh, your uh, the view of the, uh, the Government Accountability Office? From the data that we've seen, certainly the future is uncertain. The Bureau may be able to handle the workload as of today, but things are going to ramp up pretty quickly. And as an example, you heard us mention uh, the situation with the um, uh, operational control system. Right now, uh, it's, it's at a capacity where it's handling seven simultaneous users per office uh, at a time. It needs to ramp up eventually to 16, and the Bureau is definitely not there yet. But nationwide, um, right now it needs to go from 3,000 simultaneous users up to 3,000 uh, during non-response follow-up. From what we've seen, the Bureau still has a lot of work to do. Okay. Uh, Ms. Gordon, how many uh, folks on the IG staff are working on the census? 
Well, um, our plan is to have about 100 uh, members of our staff working on the census at the peak, and we're ramping up to that um, in the early How operations. many currently are? Uh, how many currently? Um, I think we have about um, 20 or so working on it currently. Okay. Uh, Mr. Jackson, in terms of the vacant delete check, uh, there's been, uh, would you tell us why there's a change of $137 million an increase in the cost estimate for this uh, vacant and delete check. Yes, sir. Uh, two major components. One, the number of vacant units, as you might suspect, is higher because of foreclosures and because of the economy than we expected when we did our initial planning, which, as you know, runs about two years ahead of when we do the operation. Also, we have added to vacant delete, and we think this is a positive step, a number of uh, a workload that consists of uh, housing units that we have identified through the LUCA process that should be included in the census. So we've added them to vacant delete so that we can uh, get those included as soon as possible and mail those households forms. What keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? Uh, well, Professionally, <laughs> not personally. <laughs> I, I, I do, I am managing uh, the two critical systems that my colleagues have mentioned daily. Uh, and we're Mention making progress. What, what two systems are those? Uh, the DAPS, the payroll system. Uh, we've recently, uh, this past weekend, uh, we upgraded that system and it is running much faster. So DAPS is, is kind of receding from my worry list. The paper-based control system I manage with my colleagues from field division and my CIO, Brian McGrath, who's here today. So we are constantly looking at what we're doing, selecting where we need workarounds so that by April 4th, we will know what system we're taking to the field, and we can test it the final two weeks before we go to non-response. So that's what keeps you up at night? That's what keeps me up, yes. Mr. Goldenkoff, I know you follow the, you know, follow the census extensively, and the Government Accountability Office, obviously, um, that's your job to have these items keep you up at night. Exactly. What are those items that keep you up at night? Uh, the operation control system. That is sort of the brains of the census. They can't conduct the field operations without it. And right now, as we see it, there, there are four issues with it. One, people. Um, they're being, they're the people who are working on the system, they're working extremely hard nights and weekends, but they're under strain. There's just not enough of them to go around, and the ability to train new people is very limited. And it's quite likely that new problems will crop up and will they be able to handle these new problems and fix the existing ones as the, as the demands on the system begin to increase? There are also hardware and software issues, um, and all this is running up against a very tight schedule. Non-response follow-up begins at a very fixed date. Other operations begin at, at very fixed dates. And if the system isn't ready, if it's not able to support these operations, you're going to start seeing schedule slippages and cost increases. How many folks at the GAO are working on the census? Right now, about 20. How many will be working on it another month or two? We'll start to ramp up, too, for field operations. Um, for example, for non-response follow-up, uh, we have um, most of our field offices involved, and so we will be um, on, on the ground uh, observing non-response follow-up. Um, next week, uh, for service-based enumeration, uh, we will have um, uh, also, most of our field offices involved in observing uh, service-based enumeration, so we are, are quite prepared. Uh, and also, uh, most notably, it's a very experienced staff, too. Virtually uh, all of our uh, middle and senior managers have experience from the 2000 census. Okay. All right. Well, Chairman Clay, I know there's an effort to get other folks asking questions, but uh, I, I certainly appreciate being very candid about this, and uh, I hope that, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Jackson, uh, most of us are, my communities are very interested in making sure the technology is available so that we can monitor the response rate, the mail response rate. I appreciate the uh, widget that we're going to be able to put on our website, but we want to be able to do that sooner rather than later so we can follow this. Yes, so. sir. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank, Thank you, Mr. McHenry, and point well taken. Mrs. Chu of California, you recognize. Yes, um, I know this uh, hearing is about the overall preparedness of the census, but I want to talk about glitches that are happening right now, uh, Mr. Jackson. Uh, in my area, there are residents that, that are complaining because the, they, they, are, they are living in one city, but they're receiving census forms that are dressed to another adjoining community. For example, residents uh, in my area who live in Hacienda Heights are getting 
uh, census forms that, that have La Puente listed as the city. And um, uh, apparently the, the uh, director, Robert, director Robert Groves put something on his blog Tuesday morning in which he said the actual location of your address has been verified for accuracy and that it was a move by the Bureau to save money. Um, and it, it streamlines how the forms are sorted and delivered to you by the U.S. Postal Office. But c you can imagine the sure. the kind of uh, feeling that people have seeing the the address listed incorrectly. Uh, and I also heard that what they're saying is that you know as far as the barcode, it's it's correct. Um, so I want to know: uh, was this discrepancy really intentional? Uh. Let me kind of explain uh, how this came about. We, uh, in working with the Postal Service, this is the largest uh, public mailing that has ever occurred, 120 million uh, addresses. The Postal Service, uh, in some zip codes, uses a single city when they have mass mailings. Uh, now, while we knew of this, we did not know exactly what city name the Postal Service would select. Mr. Jackson, would you move your mic closer, please? Okay. Uh, what city name the Postal Service would select in each zip code. And uh, we probably underestimated the public reaction because, as you say, and I would, I would agree with you, uh, it certainly is alarming to some residents. There are other zip codes like the zip code I live in where it is not unusual for me to get mail labeled Colesville, even though I live in Silver Spring. Uh, however, I realize that's not the case for everyone, and, and we underestimated that. So we have tried to emphasize that the proper counting and tabulation in a jurisdiction does not depend on the city name. And, and I think that message is now beginning to get through to some public officials because we're beginning to see those statements. The proper allocation of a housing unit to its jurisdiction really occurs when we do the physical location determination and about a year ago we did an exercise called address canvassing and we used GPS coordinates to make sure the physical housing unit was in the right block in your jurisdiction. So that's what Director Groves means when he says that it will not affect where you're counted. I would not minimize however the, the concern that the public has and we've tried through our own media arms through our partners and through our regional offices to assure residents that they will be counted in the right place. Uh, we did not anticipate this level of, of angst, and for that I, I apologize. However, it does not have to do with where people will be counted. So this, this wasn't a move to save money? Uh, the, it is a mo it's an efficiency uh, move on the part of the U.S. Postal Service, not necessarily the Census Bureau trying to save money. Uh, the Postal Service does this for reasons of efficiency and delivery accuracy. So how could we avert this from happening next time? Now it's too late. But yes, well, we, I, it, it would not be that complicated uh, now that we know the, the potential to, to cause you know, public furor. Uh, I think we will have to have an agreement of some kind with the Postal Service to use only a single city name for a given area. And, and we have a list of names. Uh, it's just that we gave the post office a choice uh, and we probably need to work through a more mutually agreeable uh, arrangement in 2020. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chu. Uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Quayo, is recognized for five Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Jackson and uh, the other witnesses, thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, Mr. Jackson, I, um, first of all, I want to thank the uh, census for the uh, heated map data. Uh, we've been keeping up that from the very first day. We appreciate that. And I've been looking, as you know, I represent the southern part of Texas, a lot of the border areas, and I've been keeping up with, um, for example, the national average as of today, uh, on March 25th, national average was 20 percent uh, on the participation rate. The state of Texas was 12. My home uh, county, which is I've been talking to Dr. Groves, and I thank him for being down there, is 2 percent. Um, then I have Stark County, which is another border county, at 4 percent, Zapata, another county at 7, uh, Hidalgo, another one at 6 percent. So you can see there's a little mm -hmm. same trend we've been seeing for, for a while. And, and as you know, I, in the past I've been bringing up questions about how you are spending that money, uh, the advertising on the spending. As you recall, I don't know if you were here, uh, last time Dr. Gross was here, I was uh, bringing up the point that 
when you all came up with your bu uh, budget on March 26th of 2009 compared to the budget from February 4th of 2010, there was a decrease in budget from local ad buys for the, uh, H, uh, the hard to count communities, but at the same time there was an increase in the budget for production and labor and so forth. So, I, I, you know, I'm one of those that I want to see the efficiencies and how you spend the best uh, dollars for this. Uh, any, any updates on the uh, uh, numbers or the budgets or, or do we still have the same lower amounts of local ads? And I'm not doing a comparison to 2010 because I know there was an increase, but I'm looking at the, uh, when you had a budget in 2009 and of course the latest budget, I, I just had a concern that you put more money for production and labor and less money for the hard to count, especially since I've been, and I had told Dr. Gross I was going to follow up and I placed a phone call today and I'm supposed to be talking to him tomorrow uh, about the hard to count that we're going to follow up on this because we've been looking at this with a lot of interest and again the heat map data I think it's one of the best things the census has done and I want to congratulate you on, yes, on that. Yes sir. Uh, Congressman let me say that uh, on the spending the spending for local ethnic audiences is, is actually higher uh, than it was in proportion to the spending for what we call diverse America. Now, y you mentioned a different categorization in terms of production from paid media by, from actually buying airtime. So I'm not sure what br break well, your... Well, the, the reference was if we could save a little bit more money in production and labor, because I think one of the things what happened, Mr. Chairman, was that Y'all were paying actors uh, money, and every time you run an ad, they get a little fee. I uh, okay. There would have been a lot of community, uh, local trusted leaders, church leaders, other community leaders at, in, in my district and other places that would have a more impact, with all due respect, than some actor from L.A. Uh, sorry, anybody from L.A. <laughs> or from somewhere else, Hollywood, should I say, that I think in my area, if you would have put one of those local trusted leaders in one of those, I think it would have had more of an impact, and I think... Uh, Chairman Lays and I have talked about this, but I, I do understand there's been an increase, but I'm t trying to squeeze more dollars right. from the production and the labor because, you know, without going to details, uh, there was an increase there. Right. Uh, let, me, let me tell you what we are doing. Uh, we do have a, a reserve fund of about $7 million, and uh, next week uh, we will be looking at um, a summary of the data that you just mentioned, the daily response rates, uh, which we track daily, uh, we look at them daily, and we will be making decisions about where to strategically place additional ads right. and, and where possibly to spend additional money in newspapers. So we are, we are, I think, where you want us to be on that. Yes, sir, and I appreciate that. I just wanted to just, because when we met uh, Chairman Lace, uh, uh, with Dr. Gross and, and your staff, that was exactly the point we we're talking about, the $7 million, and then we were going to be tracking. I think we're at the time now that Dr. Gross asked us to get back to him, and this is why I placed the phone call earlier today uh, to follow up on that, because like I said, my home county, which is I've been talking about, which is in the top 50 counties right. that, that, that are hard to count, according to your data, has 2%. And, right. and unless if it changed between the last time you updated the number, it's at 2 percent, and we have one at 4 percent, one at 6 percent, way below the 20 for the national, all that. So I just wanted to yes, we are. Can I, I let me, to the, uh, yeah, let me mention dollars. just a couple other things, Congressman, because I want you to appreciate, if possible, the efforts we're undertaking to make sure we, we do and, reach and I, everyone and there. And I do. I, I yeah. just we're doing a procedure called update enumerate, uh, where we actually do the enumeration ourselves rather than yes. mail out in, in parts of your of, of your area. Uh, we will be uh, not only uh, adding something to the strategic ads, but we have some special partnership efforts we'll be undertaking around the 10th of April that will put people on the ground to try to encourage respondents who have not responded by that point in time. And of course, we still have the replacement questionnaire uh, that we will send out next week. And, so and that and excuse me if I may, Mr. Jackson, um, would you share with uh, Mr. Cuellar and the subcommittee in writing uh, the efforts that you're, you're making certainly, in hard certainly. to count communities? Certainly. I'd be more than happy to okay. and, and to meet and with your staff. In particular in yes, South Texas. Yes, yes we will. Be more than happy. Okay. And, and again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you. I know you're all trying the best. I'm just trying to do my thank best you. to represent Appreciate my district. That's right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Jackson, what is the... Um, 
you are bringing in senior engineers from your major hardware and software vendors uh, to review the PBOCS issues. I understand that even this Tuesday there were severe performance issues. What have your engineers found and what are your immediate plans for remedy? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. We have brought in engineers not really to consult but to do. Uh, and there are parts of our configuration that have to do with uh, operating systems, uh, Oracle databases, and certain hardware configurations, network configurations that are very powerful but are somewhat new to us. So to augment our technical resources, we have brought in consultants from each of those vendors to make sure that the way we're using their technology is appropriate. Sure. Now, uh, re real quickly, tell the subcommittee about the Bureau's contingency plans in the event of a data security breach. We have a, uh, a COOP program, a continuity of operations program, and uh, for data breaches, uh, we have a established uh, set of procedures that we go through. We've actually had to go through that a couple of times where uh, the local managers have instructions as to how to secure the facility. Uh, we have uh, at the Department of Commerce a reporting of incidents that goes on every 24 hours mm -hmm. and then we have protocols for contacting local officials to make sure that anything that requires a law enforcement involvement is immediately uh, invoked. Thank you so much for the response. Mr. Goldenkopf, can you give me your general opinion as to whether uh, there is time to ensure that the Bureau's IT systems, particularly DAPS and uh, PBOCS, can meet their operational requirements? There's time, but it's running out. That's, it's running that's, out. We, that's, so that's, we, that's the bottom line. I mean, as I said before, there are these, these fixed dates. And there's still a lot of testing that needs to be done. A lot of these release, uh, not a lot, but the, the, the release the, that will be responsible for non-response follow-up, that has some known defects in it. That hasn't been fully tested yet. Um, and as these tests are completed, um, it's possible that new defects will be found. Have they followed your recommendations as to how to shore this situation up? They, they have. The, the, but they, for example, we recommended better executive level oversight, for example, mm -hmm. better coordination among the, the, the different teams, and they've, they've certainly done that, and we've given them credit for it. But in the end, there's this, these immutable deadlines and the workload that needs to be done. And mm -hmm. from what we're seeing right now, it's going to be a challenge to complete all the testing, to complete that, that workload in time for these operations to start. It's not shaping up like it should. Thank you it's for worrisome. that. Um, and Ms. Ms. Gordon, let me just have you finish it off the answers. Uh, your, your quarterly report states that census spent 15 percent less than it, it had planned for the three months ending on 09. Is it, like, is it unlikely that the census will continue similar cost containment in the coming months? Well, we would hope so, but um, we wouldn't necessarily anticipate that that would be the case. What, what we have seen is um, a lot of variability of actual costs incurred um, as compared to the cost estimates. So, um, w and we have recommended that um, census really rigorously apply internal control so that wages claimed and travel costs claimed are actually um, what was incurred. And so uh, we, you know, we're encouraging census to, to, to pay um, a, a great deal of, of attention to that to try to keep the costs on track. Thank you so much. Let me thank the entire panel for their testimony today. Uh, we appreciate you, your, your testimony and your willingness to come before the committee. And that concludes this hearing. Hearing adjourned.